and we're live hello everybody i am looking forward to this show and i hope you guys are too and i hope you brought your questions but before we do that let's make a few announcements um uh today is my wife sheila's birthday she's upstairs washing so if you guys want to say happy birthday mrs c and c uh, i'm sure she'll appreciate it she get a kick out of it in chat um that's one of the reasons we didn't do the members coffee chat this morning uh i apologize for that but we will get one in this week i'm thinking wednesday i know that uh mr tim molina who i see in there uh said tuesday works for him but i think i'm gonna fish live tomorrow um i got a couple other spots that i want to try we're gonna chase some crappie tomorrow so uh tune in for that i'll probably post the the stream up after the show i got the thumbnail all ready to go so uh uh check out the channel and set your reminders uh we'll be on the water tomorrow and uh we'll do the members only uh coffee chat in the morning uh same time only on wednesday this week uh actually no not on wednesday we'll do it on thursday wednesday i gotta meet the gas company that's another long story anyway so um also ryan bortz asked me to uh shout out the boat month long boat tournament that uh um him and uh kayak mike are uh um the ones to ask questions about if you're interested in it it's through the chaos app i believe it's a boat tournament so you register your boat so if you have a partner or a net man um it, it, it's by boat all the catches in the boat do count um so that'll be a cool tournament there is an entry fee of 100 so if you have any questions message ryan bortz of uh, Ryan Bortz Blue Collar Life or Kayak Mike of the Kayak Mike channel, and they'll uh, point you in the right direction. It seems like it'll be a fun one to have. Uh, a month long tournament seems like uh, it'll even it out, and it being uh, inches rather than weight, uh, we'll add that uh, kayak flavor to it, uh, which people are really starting to like these days. Uh, also, that being said, I want to thank Jeremy over at uh jeremy calvin fishing for these cool jigs we might have a giveaway for these people so uh not tonight um but uh in an upcoming episode uh so stay tuned for that i appreciate you jeremy you're awesome thanks for sending these um if i don't forget i'm gonna throw these in my boat we're gonna give them a shot tomorrow i think we're gonna get on some fish uh at least a couple uh if not a lot so uh, uh i also want to give a shout out to james dockery great job on the tournament whooping my butt this weekend that was a lot of fun i appreciate you great job everybody you fished out there everybody from uh dockery josh freddie um jeremy uh roger um um uh justin uh everybody who was in it uh you guys did great if i missed anybody please forgive me so um um great weekend had a lot of fun um you guys are all awesome so uh let's get started Oh, let's let's get started with the shout outs. I almost forgot, David. If I do that, they'll they'll be upset. I don't want to leave anybody out here. I see Rob over at two old I see Rob over at two old vets, uh crew member. What's going on, Rob? How you doing? Two stands fishing. What's going on, Stan? Another great crew member. I saw Betty, Betty Jean, crew member. What's up, Betty Jean? How you doing? Dear, I see Air Run in the house. What's up, Air Run? Carmel Muncie, what's up, buddy? I see Chris Uzzleton. What's up, Chris? There's Miss Chrissy Brown, crew member. There's Skip over at Clearview Outdoors. I see Crappie Day Fish on in the house. What's up, Crappie? There's my friend David Martin. It's always good to see David in here. Crew member, Fishing Freedom. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Fishing with Squirrel. What's up? There's Fishing with the Chad. How you doing, Chad? If you can let me know how my sound's going via text, I'd appreciate it, buddy. Another great crew member. I want to make sure I say hello to D because I know she's out there listening. What's up, D? How you doing? Another great crew member. What's up, dear? Uh, Fish in the Mid-South. He he was in the tournament, too. Uh, what's going on? Uh, PD was in the tournament. Got to give PD a shout-out, too. Uh, Lyle was... Uh, um, um, had some health issues at home with uh, Cindy. Hopefully Cindy's doing better. Uh, he was in it too. See, I'm remembering these things as we go. I see Freddie's Outdoor Adventures crew member. What's up, Freddie? How you doing? There's Bumpin' Mike Greenwell at Greenwell Fishing. Uh, James Kirkpatrick. What's going on, James? How you doing, bud? Saw you on Avid Show. Great night. Great night. There's Jeremy Colvin Fishing. What's going on? um i see john patrick jr what's up john patrick justin's fishing fetish great show on saturday you did awesome 
Uh, Kevin Baker, uh, Nuts and Bolt Fishing. What's going on, Kevin Baker? There's LG Bass, crew member, who's going to be hosting a show uh, with Jody this week. Say, um, We'll get those times for you by the next show. I forgot. Forgive me, uh, Tom. Um, Luther um, Harlow, what's up, Luther? Mike Irvin, what's up, Mike? Uh, crew member, Mike's Fishing Home, what's up, buddy? Nina's Kayak Crew, what's up, Nina? Another great crew member. There's Kevin of Palmetto Cats. What's going on, Kevin? How you doing, bud? Parker Pursuits going on parker there's jody from pontoon jody's catfishing real gals fishing what's up ricky over at solo text adventures what's up ricky there's kelly at the the bullock experience i think he's got chris Souders on his show this week check out his channel for times and uh details there's josh the weekend angler that he killed the uh bluegills this week i think he got 100 or so or just under 100 fish that was crazy crew member tim molina what's up again tim how you doing bud uh texas tx tiger what's up happy birthday to you sir everybody say happy birthday to tiger it's his birthday today welcome my friend there's crew member the great uncle lou love uncle lou rods player boards good stuff let's see if i missed anybody uh, Brian B. Catfishing. What's up, crew member? How you doing, my friend? Brian B.'s got his no script. I saw him out there fishing with uh, 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 Haz, and it was also P. Smitty and Epic in the other boat. I was watching that. That was a cool cool deal they had going on. There was a ton of smack talk going on. I wouldn't uh, expect anything less. There's Darlene Perry. What's going on, Darlene? Uh, let's see. Fishing with Squirrel. What's up, Squirrel? Fishing in the Mid-South. I said hello. Hey, look, there's fishing with Dom. How you doing, Dom? Dom's in the, um, Dom is in the great state of Michigan, and he fishes for a lot of channel cats. I have a feeling Dom's going to have some questions for you, Dave. Uh, cool. let's see. James, Jeremy, John Patrick, Justin, Fishing Fetish, Luther Harlow. If I'm saying hello to you twice, forgive me. We're getting a lot of people. We've got 62 people in chat. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you for the super chat, Jody. I really appreciate it uh, for the zebra cake funds. Awesome. And I want to thank Crappie Day Fish On for becoming a member. Your support helps to support the uh, the channel. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy the, the coffee chats that we do every week, and hopefully you can make them. It's kind of an off-the-record thing. Not an off-the-record, but it's less of a show format and more of a um, what's going on with, with me, the channel, and everybody else that's a member so uh you get to come up and, and and hang out we just enjoy coffees once a week so very cool welcome to the catfish and crappie podcast my name is mark and i am thrilled to have my buddy dave weimer back this week again to answer all your questions how you doing dave doing good doing good Glad awesome here. thanks for having me on Good. So uh, here's what we're going to do. We got a lot of live people in chat. I'm going to keep an eye out for some questions. So if people have questions, I'm going to ask them. Uh, if you could please put a special character before your question, and we'll get it there. If you want questions answered right away, um, we're, we're going to answer them as they come. Of course, Super Chats always take priority over uh, uh, the rest of them, but we're going to try to get as many questions as we can in today. Hopefully you guys have some good ones. David's a, a wealth of knowledge. He's been doing this for a long time. So uh, um and I want to thank you again for being on the um, on the master class series that I'm having here on the channel. It's really cool to have people of your caliber and, and, and get to share that information out with with my subscribers. So uh, that was really cool. I really enjoyed doing that show. The first one we had was with Lyle, Lyle Stokes, where we talked catfish rods. You were my second one. I got some ideas for some some other ones, and uh, um, I appreciate you doing this. So, uh, wow, that was a mouthful. Once I get rolling, Dave, I don't stop. It's all right. The more you talk to us, you know, I can just hear it. All right. Eric, it all in. Eric B. starting out with the first question. Eric B. is a great fisherman. Uh, he lives here in Illinois. He's, he's a guide himself. So uh, his first question is, where are you from? Okay. I'm in from the Des Moines, Iowa area. And if you're not familiar with Iowa, Des Moines is pretty much right in the middle. Okay. Well, yeah, that answers. I don't want to, uh, before we go too far, it sounds like there's uh, a little bit of an echo. Is that on my end? or? Oh, that's that's me. Know. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, Let it's me... just throwing me off slight. How's that sound? Is that better? Um, yep. That's okay, perfect. We'll move the mic back here, too. All right, sorry about the echo. We got Freddy's Outdoor Adventures. He says, favorite bait for fall, winter cats? Well, that's easy. My bait doesn't change year-round, so... Um, I typically enjoy using bluegills and shad as my go-to bait. 
but of course, you know, you want to obviously check with your state regulations on what you can and can't use, but um, I don't change it because the fish don't change what they eat year round. So I just keep it simple. And if that's what they're feeding on and that's what their diet is, that's what I want to try to offer. Now, is this something that you've learned from the biologists that you talk to? No, I, honestly, like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to down, downgrade the question, mm -hmm. but it's really, it's just simple. Um, the, the fish are used to eating X, Y, and Z other fish that are in there. So don't change that. I mean, don't go, don't go off the wall crazy. Just keep it simple. Feed them what their normal diet is and that's what they're going to be used to eating. Very cool. You know, um, uh, to build a little bit on that question is, um, what are you confident with? I have this weird thing where certain times of the day or certain times of the year, I kind of change my bait up when I'm chasing catfish. Um, and I don't know for sure if it helps, but it makes me feel better about myself, to be honest with you. But it's good to know that someone like you believes that, that it really does it. So, Well, whatever you do that makes you feel more confident, you're going to fish it better. Does that make sense? That makes all the sense in the world confident. to me. Trust me, I've, I've come across this too. Fishing with Dom does have a question. He says, what are the key factors that help a fishery produce bigger channel cats? All right. Well, uh, Fish with Dom, I think, is one of the people who follows me on Instagram. Uh, so thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, some of the factors are going to be some of the different things we talked about on the previous episode. But number one, I believe, is going to be water quality. Um the better the water quality and the purer the water is, the healthier the fish are going to be and the more that they're going to be able to put that energy towards growing and being a healthier fish. The fighting off diseases and uh, poor water quality is, is a little harder on bait fish and other things like that. So I would say number one is going to be the water quality. Number two is just going to be a general practice of selective harvest. Uh, you're not going to continue to have a, a lot of trophy fish in the lakes if you if people continue to um, over harvest some of the lakes that you know that are some of the smaller areas that are going to for an example we had a, a place here in the Des Moines area that I actually guided on for a couple of years starting out and it was a great fishery had good water quality um, and it had phenomenal catfish. It'd be nothing to go out there and catch 25 or 30 fish, and they were all good fish in just a few hours. Somebody put an illegal uh, trout line in there, and I found it one day in my trolling motor, and I pulled it up, and it was, I mean, we're talking long, a good 100 feet or more. And it was just chock full of catfish. And I don't know how long that person had been doing that, but I know that it, they were... Um, Turned in after that, I, I found their actual fishing license and some other stuff that they left out there. But after that, it really turned the lake completely down. Uh, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'll just say, you know, you can take too many fish out of a, a smaller body of water and it takes years to, re to re replace those. So water quality and selective harvest, I think, are the two big things. It's not the first time I've heard it about the water quality. We did a, um, we had a, a gentleman named Bob Lusk when I was, uh, well, while I, I helped Lyle Stokes with uh, Panfish Nation, we host a show, and we had Bob Lusk who, uh, um, uh, he he's, he designs ponds for like the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, the owner of Bass Pro Shops, and he says the biggest thing, the the biggest thing that that he feels determines the health the quality size of, of of fishery is water quality so i'm definitely not not surprised to hear that from you dave so cool um texas tiger thanks for becoming a a, a member i appreciate you again it goes to help support the channel uh chris Hesselton, yeah chris that's exactly uh, how you get your questions noticed so cool uh let me scroll down here all right, Justin's fishing fetish says, where should you target cats in the lakes with cold water? Well, I tend to go a little deeper. You know, I think that those fish are going to be hugging close to the bottom in those deep holes, just like when we ice fish for them. We're looking for the, the deepest holes of the lake uh, or the ledges and the transitions closest to the deepest holes. But you have to understand that a fish wants to be comfortable. 
and it doesn't matter year round, uh, warm water, cold water, sunny days, cloudy days, uh, windy days, calm days, the fish want to be comfortable and they want to use as little energy as possible to be comfortable. Kind of like people. I mean, I'm that way the older I get. <laughs> I just want to be comfortable and use as little energy as I can to, to be that way. Um, but you're going to have that warmer water in those deeper holes in the winter time. And those fish are going to stick down there right on the bottom. I noticed the last few weeks that I was fishing, every single fish that we caught, I always looked at their their uh, their belly and they were covered in mud. So, uh, you know, those those fish are smart, and they're going to use that bottom, especially like in a silt or a mud uh, bottom, to kind of burrow into and hunker into, and it works kind of like a blanket effect. Uh, where their body heat is going to get in there and it's going to be trapped. So that's where they're going to want to be in those cooler uh, times of the year in the cooler water. So we're, you know, our biggest, the lake I fish, the deepest hole is about 36 feet, but it's not really uh, the most ideal location as far as uh, where it's at on the lake. So I'm spending the majority of my time the last month of the year fishing 25 to 30 feet of water and they're just stacked. Yeah, the they got all stacked in there. That's that's pretty cool to know. What people, you know, it, and a lot of people in my chat here don't have any experience ice fishing, but you you learn that you know in the colder seasons that deeper doesn't always mean colder. It could actually mean warmer as well, right? Because of the, the way the water gets stratified right. in there. Yeah, yeah so. it stratifies differently. So the times um, when I used to scuba dive a lot, it was pretty well known fact that about every three feet of water, there's a temperature change. And so that's why it's, it's a good idea to get like surface temperatures, but that's not really what the actual fishing temperature mm -hmm. is. It just kind of gives you an idea, hey, this is what it is on the, the top side. So you can kind of put the, that piece of the puzzle together to know where to, where to go on the lake to, to use it. But ultimately the best thing, if you really wanted to, to be scientific about it, is what drop down thermometer. But you just, I mean, you know, like you. Hey, Right. Water temperature is this degrees, you know, then I'm going to be fishing this in deeper water. So. Yeah, you know that it's going to it's going to be a couple degrees warmer, especially late, late, late in the year, early in the winter. So, all right. Yeah, you can assume that pretty safe. All right. Nina's kayak crew has a good question. She says, what type of rods and reels do you use or do you sure. like to use? Well, Nina's, thank you for the, the question. Um, the only reel or the only rods that I use are the Whisker Seeker seven, seven foot six, medium heavy casting rods. And the only reels that I really ever used are the Abu Garcia, the 6500 C3 catfish specials. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. Every year I get new rods um, just because it's part of the benefit for fishing uh, for Whisker Seeker. There's nothing wrong with them. They, they catch hundreds and hundreds of fish every, every year. But um, I'll tell you those reels are like Sherman tanks. Uh, I just took them in for the first time Friday, I think it was, in the four or five years that I've had them, to just get a once-over from our, our real shop here. And I bet you they've caught anywhere between five to 6,000 fish on them, and I've had zero issues with them. And I haven't had any rod issues either. I, like I said, I just get, get the new ones each year, but I really enjoy the rods, um, the Whisker Seeker rods, because as we talked a little bit on the, at the previous episode, and I hate to bounce back to that, but we did spend a lot of time on rods is there's, you can feel what's going on on the other line or at the end of the line and that rod sense enough, sensitive enough. And every part of that rod, the action, the backbone, uh, the fighting portion of it, it's all built to let the fish fight the rod where you can get into some different rods that are just uh, overly strong and something's got to give on the weakest part is generally the, the skin of the fish when you hook them with circle hooks. That's why I choose that in the equipment. That I choose. Very cool. Um, Two Stance Fishing says, uh, when water temps drop, where do you look for big fish? Deep water. Honestly, I mean, I, I hate to give you a short, quick answer, um, but it's as simple as that. And so, you know, I can keep, I can, I can give you a, a, a long detailed answer, but go to your deeper holes. That's going to be the, the quick, easy, 
stick to that. When the water temperature gets colder, go to your deeper holes and, and go to that. And if that is, if they're not there, try there first. So that's what I normally do. I hit my deep hole first, but then I go immediately to a transition area next to it. So it, it, five feet can make a big difference. You know, I can be in 30 to 32 feet of water, but as soon as I hit that 25 to 27, that might be where they are. They might be staging to go to those deep holes, or they might have been in those and staging to go up a little shallower to feed them on what's moving around up there. And these are in lakes, correct? Yeah, honestly, um, if people ask me a bunch of river questions, I'm not going to be able to give you great answers. Okay, I just want to make sure that people realize that because I, I I do know that you you you, you fish a lot of lakes. So uh, sure. uh, we have Kelly over at the Bullock Experience has the question of the night. Probably he says, "What is your opinion on chicken as bait?" I believe is what he's asking. Yeah. Um. Go back to one of the original questions: is fish don't generally eat chicken, so I like to keep it simple and, and feed them what they're used to eat. If you've ever been to any of my seminars or read anything that I've been part of that was published, uh, I'm a huge believer in feeding them what they're used to eating. So if, and there's a lot of ways and you can tell I, I have to pause and, and slow myself down when my wheels start going so I can think it through, see which route I want to go and then explain it in a way that everybody can understand it. Um, I'll give you the very quick explanation as to why I, I do this. I do think that fish have trigger mechanisms, um, like fish strike out of vibration. That's why certain baits work. There's certain trigger strikes. I think that if you get a bait that's used to, close to a fish that's used to eating and they're hungry and they smell it, basically however you want to refer to that, that can trigger a a reaction, you know, a reactionary bite or response because their biology is telling them that's food, eat it. You know, they don't have a great big brain to think things through. They just have a tiny brain that works on a few things. Be comfortable and eat and don't, you know, don't get killed. Don't get eaten by another fish. That's how fish think in, in general. Um, so I relate it all. I, all I got to do is a lot of analogies to bacon. If I walked you into a place and I said they're cooking one thing and you have to tell me what it is. I guarantee you 99% of the people in here, if they didn't see it and they didn't hear it and they smelled bacon, they would say somebody's cooking bacon. And I think it relates to the same thing to fishing. If you just get that scent down there and it's something that they're used to eating, um, I think it's going to take you leaps and bounds further than a lot of manufactured and concocted baits that are out. And I'm glad you said baking because that's like my favorite thing. Everybody in chat happens to know this. Sometimes I get started. I don't think I've had a podcast where we didn't mention the word bacon, and and you did it for me, Dave. So I want to tell you I appreciate you, man. I had to figure yeah. out how to get that in there, and I didn't have to do it tonight. Freddie's Outdoor Adventures, he says, do you bump, drag, or anchor for cats in the winter during midday and and any specific depth, I guess he's asking? Yeah. Um, so my style of fishing – is 100% moving. I, I, I troll the whole time. And I'm going to refer to trolling and drifting as primarily from the rest of, for the rest of the show as trolling. In a sense, it's the same thing, but I hate drifting and I hate using drift stocks and I only do it if it's an absolute means to an end. So I prefer to troll at any given cost. I will wear my battery down or, or whatever, but trolling is what I do. And the whole reason is that we're looking for the fish that are active. We're looking for the fish that are hungry, and we're trying to stay on them. So as soon as we get the first fish uh, caught or the first solid bite, and if it's not hooked up, you know, there was the first attempt. It was legit. That's what I want to start marking, and I want to figure out my route and pattern from there, which I have, you know, predetermined before we get started. And as soon as the, the fish stop, that's where I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to go right through those fish again. So I don't bump. Um, that's more of a river tactic. Uh, I have bumped off the back of my boat while we're trolling before. And it, it really is basically the same thing as doing it in the river system. The concept's the same. It's a little bit different technique as far as boat control and stuff like that. But uh, trolling is, is what I do to, to stay on the fish and, and find the fish that are active, especially in the winter months, because a lot of those fish are slowed down. 
And so if you can find the, the pod of fish that are hungry and active, stay on them until they're, they're not biting anymore and then go find the next ones that are out there. And yeah, I, I'm sorry, I gotta get kind of close because the, the writing's dying right here, so. Um, okay, midday, uh, I don't change my tactic or my technique at all. So sunrise, the sunset, midday, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, it's all the same. I'm constantly moving. I don't anchor, I don't even own an anchor. Um, I'm just constantly looking for the next group of active fish. And by the time that the water's pulled, those fish are spooled back up and they're they're in groups. And when you find the ones that are hungry, it's fast and furious. And it's the same way during ice fishing. You drill on those on those cats and you're on the ones that are hungry, you can't hardly get a rod set before it's going back off again. In the depth, I think we kind of covered that, but look for your deeper holes. Deeper holes. And and I want to remind everybody in chat that you are in Iowa and Iowa does get iced over. So if you're a, a southern uh, um, cat fisherman, um, your results may vary in the coldest of, of winter months, correct, Dave? Yeah, everything's going to be dependent on, you know, what yep. your situation what your situation and scenario is. Uh, good point, and thanks for bringing it up. And I'm in Iowa where you can have a winter that's 30, 40 degrees, or you can have a winter that's 30 and 40 below. Yeah, it only took me like 30 show, th doing 30 of these shows to try and keep everybody in mind while I'm doing these. So it took me a while to figure it out, but we're there. Yeah. <laughs> Kenneth over at Takedown Catfish, and I hope that answered your question. He was asking basically if you, uh, uh, your favorite way to fish and, and and it is your dragon baits correct yep always moving yeah. looking for the next group of hungry fish. skip he's a great angler out there in in ohio he says uh uh what hooks work best for you um so i'm a big fan of the circle hook and i use uh two just two different hooks so my go-to is the triple threat and i'm sorry you guys are probably going to get tired of me hearing about whisker secrets or talking about it, but it's a company I fish for. So everything that I use as far as terminal tackle rods and gears is, is provided by them and I don't fish other things. So I'm, I'm referring to the product um, more than maybe what you probably or what some people, I'm not trying to push the product is what I'm saying. It's just what I have to use. So I'm trying to give you an answer off of the products that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to, I don't want to be one of those guys. So this is the only option. And, and if what I need. And if you follow Dave on, on Facebook, I do have the link down in the description. Give him, give his service or um, give that link a, a, a click, follow him. And uh, he puts fish on the boat. So I have no doubt that those products he uses definitely get the job done. So wouldn't you agree? They do what you need them to do, right? Yeah. Stay humble on that, but they, they work well. Um, to answer that question a little bit more in detail, though, uh, circle hook is, is my go-to. Um, I really prefer, though, the triple threat, which is by Whisper Seeker, and I use that in a six and an eight on. Um, eight on uh, only one particular lake that has some really big channels in it, and we're throwing baits the size of my hand or three quarters the size of my hand. How, how big a bait? Well, you can't put this into perspective, but, you know, our average bait is probably – four inches by four inches so okay. it's pretty big um, so you're throwing you're throwing pretty big chunks of bait as far as channel cats are concerned right yeah but there's okay. some huge fish in there my my other guy that uh lives on that lake he caught one last week that was just a pinch under 20 i believe so 20 pounds that's a huge iowa channel cat like massively huge. that's so a I, good channel cat anywhere i don't care where you're at 20 pounds would make me happy all day long Right. And I, I'd, I'd get home happy and my wife would think I'd caught fish when I got home for sure with that one. So <laughs> she claims that I'm get, if I don't catch fish and I come home, she says I'm crabby. So she's probably right. Well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go into that question just a little bit further. If you don't mind. Uh, absolutely. So, go ahead. Um, the reason I like the triple threat is the fact that I take new people out fishing every day. New meaning they're new to me and I don't know their style of fishing or their expertise or how, how well they understand putting the whole concept together. So the triple threat, the fish sometimes can hook themselves. It's designed also that you can sweep the rod and get a hook set, or you can reel down and and uh, get that hook to turn and, and get a hook set that way. So it, the design of the hook allows for um, a more consistent hookup, 
with people who have different styles. And when I take people out, you know, I'm trying to teach them. Uh, I'm going to say the right way because there is a right way and a wrong way to put all this piece, all these pieces together to make the concept work. But having an extra variable like a hook that can have three actions of hooking the fish is definitely going to be more successful than just one, one option. So that's why I choose that hook, and that's the size I use is typically a six aught, uh, and it hasn't failed me. They're laser sharp. I mean, it's scary how sharp. All right, cool. Tim Molina, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Tim Molina says, thank you for the quality guest. I couldn't agree more, and thanks for coming on. Sunfish King actually has a question for me. Let me answer this real quick. Uh, he says, what streaming service and camera are you using, Catfish and Crappie? Uh, right now, I'm just using a basic Logitech webcam. When I'm live streaming on my boat, I'll use my Apple my Apple iPhone 11 Pro Max, uh, and I use StreamYard. So, uh uh, hopefully that helps. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. My contact information is on my About page, uh, or you can just kind of reach out and contact me through uh, uh, Facebook. That's uh, always a good way to go as well, because I always have it open during the day. So, okay. Frank has a, I don't know if this is a question, but he says, every time I get them on, uh, on ice, they're suspended over a basin. I think I find that to be true, too. Um, I wanted to wait towards the end of the show before we started talking about ice fishing for them, but um, the question came up from Frank anyway. So uh, is there any reason why they would be in the basin, or is that just a coincidence that we're finding them there? Um, I'll be honest with you. I have never caught the channel cat suspended in the ice. Uh, I've caught them on the bottom or within a few inches on the of bottom. the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it is, you know, if you want to consider the basin, the deeper hole of the lake, that's what I would consider, you know, a basin. And I would agree with the location of it. Um, the suspended part of it is throwing me a little bit for a loop because typically when I've dropped down and seen them on cameras or we've seen them on flashers and caught them, they've all been within generally 10 to 15 inches on the bottom, if not right, right smack on the bottom very Okay, I saw a question up here. I'm trying to scroll back to the chat's going pretty quick. Uh, Frank made another statement here. It says, I promise water temp is over 32. Uh, at least the mineral content gets heavy. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. Uh, let's see over here. Uh, Local Life Outdoor says, any advice on fishing for big cats on shallow rivers or rivers that have been, uh, they have down there in South Carolina? I believe that Dave is uh, a lake fisherman. Um, I don't know if you can help him with any of that, Dave. You know, uh, some of the, the tactics don't change, though. So if you can figure out where those fish want to be comfortable and where they're going to expend the least amount of energy, that's where you're going to want to target uh, first and foremost. Whether there's big fish there or small fish, that could just be the um, the dynamics of that that river that you're in. I mean, generally they're going to have different quality fish, if you want to call them that, or different size fish. But it's not like one spot's going to hold the bigger, better fish than the other. It's going to be is the is the structure and the depth and the contours where the fish want to be. So, you know, things that I would look for would be any types of water seams or breaks where you have a fast current to slow current, and that's going to push uh, bait around, especially on the backside of those eddies and, and how the water swirls, you know, back around there. Smaller fish get trapped in those and they are tired from, you know, being in the river system when the current moves through and they're looking for the quick, easy jet out of there. Yeah, like, like food conveyor belts, right? Bingo. Yeah. Pretty much. Avid Fisherman has a question. He says, channel cats and thermoclines, uh, what are your thoughts? So thermocline, you know, by definition is uh, where your water separation is. And also has a lower density of oxygen. So you generally aren't going to find fish below the thermocline, but you may find them right near the thermocline. Uh, we don't have a tremendous amount of thermoclines in the lake that I you know, that I fish, but I understand how the science of the thermoplane works. And going back to the scuba diving days, I've actually dove down and seen visibly, you can see the thermoplane in the water 
which is why your sonar picks it up. It's a it's a different consistency, if you will, of the water, if that makes any sense. Well, actually, it it, it does now that you mention it, because you got to tweak your sonar and under different water conditions. So if mm-hmm. you got different water conditions and layers in the same body of water, that's how it's picking it up. Correct. Right. So those okay. two things, they you know, they stratify um, together. It actually appears in the water as a, a milky. It almost looks like milky water. That's the best way to, to try to mm-hmm. explain it without seeing it firsthand. But there's a significant temperature difference in between, you know, water above the thermocline and below it. But you can tell that the water below it, being that it's more of a, and I, I, I don't have a better term than thicker water, but mm-hmm. where those two combine, you can tell going below that thermocline that it's kind of stagnant. And a lot of that is because of the lack of oxygen um, that's down there in the lack of movement where that thermocline almost acts kind of like a shield or a barrier. So your fish are going to be probably pretty close to it, but generally not going to be below it. Cool. Hey, there's fishing kit. I'm guessing he knows you, Dave. He says, hello, yeah, David dude. Mark. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like Kit. He's a good guy. He yeah, says, does yeah. facial hair help you catch bigger fish? Heck yeah, it does. That's, it all, it all started with, uh, uh, I should go in the story or not, but I will. Um, it all started with the no shave November at work. I work on a fire department, and generally you can't have facial hair. But I switched to an inspector rule about seven years ago, almost to the day. And I wasn't wearing fire gear anymore, so I was growing the beard for no shave November. Well, I couldn't do that because a lot of the guys kind of got angry that they weren't able to grow beard, you know, that I was because of our policy. So I asked, you know, what's the best thing I can get away with as close to it? And here we are. And now I've just kind of kept it since then. And when I go different places, more people recognize me from the mustache than they do me. Hey, you're that guy. I remember. So how do you know who I am? It's a mustache. So it's <laughs> kind of become a trademark, you know, I guess. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was a, a, a hazmat guy back in my younger days. And that's why I went to a goatee. And that's where this one came from, because I was able to wear the gear with the goatee rather than having a full beard. But anyways, let's let's get on to some other questions. How you doing, Kit? Thanks for coming in. But uh, Muskrat Adventures say, do channel cats group up right like blues in cold water? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, looking at how the fish kind of go throughout the year in a different cycle, springtime, they're kind of still schooled up and together. And then as they start going into their spawn, not every fish spawns at the same time. They're going to kind of um, become solo at, at this time. You know, the females are going to go up and lay eggs, and then they come back. The males fertilize eggs and guards the nest. And mid, to late, you know, mid to late summer, depending on what the, wa- the weather's doing during that time, you're going to get ones and twos, mostly females, obviously, for like 45 days stretch. And then after that, those fish are going to start schooling up again. And you can start, you can tell when they start schooling up when you start getting one and two together. And then the next week, it's um, so like one and two would be like I caught one, and then five minutes later, I caught one. And then maybe like three or four days later to a week later, oh, now we have a double. I mean, you get a double for another week, you know, and then like, hey, now we got three going off or we caught two and then 45 seconds to a minute, minute, two minutes, whatever later, we got three. And those fish are starting to school up and they'll stay like that all the way through the rest of the winter and the next day. So it, it, it'll take them that long to get schooled up. It could take weeks, huh? It can, like this year, you know, I mean, man, this year was like a, a headache every day. Um, I mean, even in until the last few weeks of... Uh, my fishing season, I was catching skinny males that were still bleeding from, you know, doing their thing. I don't get uh-huh. it. And this whole year has just been weird. But typically speaking, you know, you're going to have about a 45 day window where that spawns a, a kick to the boy. You know, it's, it's just that. Yeah, I have a feeling what we'll, it is. We'll, we'll talk about the spawn here in a second. But let's see. Corey from the Flatty Daddies. What's going on, Corey? Congratulations on your PB Flathead again, but he's got a great channel. Check him out, everybody. Uh, from your uh, diving experience, have you noticed if rivers have the same difference in temps at various depths uh, like lakes, or is it more uniform because of the flow? So it's, it's typically more uniform because of the flow. Um, you're going to have a, a few different areas where the water temperature 
is going to vary and they're going to be in areas that are out of the flow and some of your deeper fluids. So if you think of water, water as energy, because water has energy and water has, um, has thermal energy, if you want to call it that. So as water moves, it loses some of that energy and loses some of that, that temperature. If you think of a hot pool that's calm, uh, you, you know, like, let's say you go back into a shallow cove or you go into a cove where there's no wind on a hot day, you dip your toes in there and it's going to be kind of warm water. You go out to the main lake on a windy day, you dip your toes in there, it's going to be cool. And it could be the, you know, the same day, whatever you want, but that water loses its thermal energy as it's moving and it's turning and those molecules are mixing, warmer and cooler, and they're losing some of their energy. So in your river system, um, it's pretty consistent because that water is consistently generally moving unless you find the back back waters if you want to call it that or like the the fingers or the holes were um, or areas behind like jams and stuff like that or jetties where that water is a little bit more uh, stagnant it's going to be a warmer water. which makes sense i mean it's like <clears throat> air passing through a radiator correct yeah, exactly. That same that same effect. Uh, Brent, Nicolette, what's going on? How you doing? Thanks for checking out the channel. We appreciate you. It says, how do you pick leader length and weights on Santee rigs on lakes like Sailorsville, Sailorville? Yeah. Hey, Brent, how are you? It's uh, it's good to hear from you. So I, I see Brent quite often um, on the water, and he's a good guy. Um, so typically, to, to answer your question, is my leader length is generally the same all the time. Uh, it's going to be somewhere between 14 and 20 inches. And honestly, what I do is I, I cut off about 24 inches. I tie my first knot and then I hold my rig up and I go, yeah, that looks about right. And I tie it, you know, tie it on there. There's no scientific reason behind it. It's just, I typically go with about from my thumb to my elbow. So whatever that is, you know, maybe 20 inches or something, or not even 20 inches, it's probably more like 16 inches or something like that. And that's kind of a, kind of a general rule of thumb, but there's no, there's no great answer. Can, can to you it. go too short or too long with a leader? Do you believe that that's possible? Yeah, I think that too short is a hindrance. Um, and I think that too long can be somewhat of a hindrance too. You know, if you're looking at, and there's, there's a lot of answers to um, everything in different bodies of water and different species of, you know, of fish, blues, channels, planets, things like that. So um, spe specifically to his, you know, to his question, on the, he fishes the same like I do. And like I said, I see him almost every single day that I'm on the water. Um, the leader length is going to be generally about that 16 inches or so. And the weight, I'm going to go, I'm going to answer his question specifically. I'm going to come back to, to your, okay. okay? Um, and then weight wise, I typically like two ounces and that's something that I put on a sinker slide. Um, that's got the clip on it. So it's easy to change if I want to, but two ounces is pretty good up to about 20 mile an hour winds. And I'll keep the weight on the bottom. If it gets a little bit windier than that. Maybe I'll clip on like a one ounce with it. I don't have three ounce weights. So, um, if I have to add more, I'll just I buy one and two ounce weights. And excuse me, what I what I use are like uh, structure snakes or drifting sticks. And I don't use lead. I'll tell you, man, since I switched to more of a stick type of weight, I don't lose rigs nearly as much as I did when I had lead, like a, mm. a you know any type of lead weight down there. The other thing too is I like my boat. And I don't like when fish get close to it and I'm slinging two ounces of lead around and hitting the side of my boat. So the the protected stick style weights are, are what I like for multiple different reasons. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about that or, or the comment you made about the wind. I never thought how wind would affect not just, you know, your boat and how you're dragging, but how the bait sits on the bottom or how the weight of what you're dragging sits behind the boat. So that's definitely something that I'm, I'm glad somebody asked. So see, you I'll learned something. That I, mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like if I if I I don't want to get too far off too many points, but the weight makes a massive massive difference on a windy day. And I'll tell you, I'll, I've been on like, and Brett will know, you know, Sailorville can get really rough on on anything over twenty mile an hour, especially in the summer. 
It's always a south wind. And Mark, you probably don't know if the lake runs north and south. That's somewhat narrow. So if I'm putting in, you know, six, seven miles down, those those waves have a, a lot of uh, energy by the time they're, you know, two, three feet up and down, and they're they're fast moving. So wave, wave, wave. Mm -hmm. And I want to keep my bait and start. And the only way to do that is to use a heavier weight. Um, so when those rods lift up and down, and I also, and this I'm going, we're going to go into go some of the scientific stuff too, but that's also where I re, I like almost dump the first spool on those windy days. I let as much line out as I can before I start getting back to so almost back. And then it doesn't have quite so much up and down. Yeah, the geometry heavier. makes up for it. Bingo. Yeah, and you got to do that. Otherwise, you're just going to be pulling basic. You know, up and down up, and bouncing around. Down. Yep. You're already pulling it in one direction. You don't need to be pulling it in three other directions. So, so let uh, me go back to your leader length question. Uh -huh. uh, to answer that one a little bit more specific, um, I do believe if you're fishing for different species, it makes more of a difference. I think for channel cats, the majority of the time they're going to spend their, their lifespan within one to three feet of the bottom. And if you cut that half the distance or a little bit shorter, you're going to be okay in leader. Gotcha. Cool. Fishing with squirrels says, uh, or asks, when you say deep holes, how deep are you talking about? So, um, fishing with squirrels, I like squirrels. Uh, it, it's going to be dependent on what your body of water is. You know, we have a lake in Iowa that has um, the deepest holes 12 feet, but the average you know, depth of the lake is generally three to four or five feet. So that's your deep hole. It would benefit the person to get some type of a lake map and look at the, the topography um, or the contours of the lake and see where the map says the deeper holes are, you know? So that's where, I mean, it's, it's just relative to that body of water, but a deep hole can be anything that's deeper than the, the average pool. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Skip over at Clearview Outdoor says, how about the dog days of summer? Where do you find fish? Early in the morning. <laughs> That's where you find fish. It doesn't hungry. help. It, it, it's not <laughs> bad to beat the sun before it gets up either for your your own comfort. So Right. So, I mean, really, the, you can. I do my trips like this. In the, in the early morning, we're on the water at 6 o'clock. So that means that, you know, we get there a little bit early. We shake hands, do what we got to do, sign paperwork. So drinks in the cooler. We're on the water at six, and then we have lines in the water by six fifteen. My trips run five hours, and generally speaking, at ten thirty to ten forty, the bite just shuts completely down. And we're talking like the like he says the dog days of summer, where the high mm -hmm. is going to be ninety five to one hundred and five or whatever the case is, and it's sunny and no clouds. By fishing, the best part of the fishing is going to be early in the morning or right at dusk. But that's I mean I hate to say it like a. How about the dog? Where do you find them? Well, location-wise, you know, I'm going to typically be in the in the shallower waters, the mid-depth waters. And again, that's all relative. But keep in mind the lake that I primarily fish on, the deepest parts a little over 30 feet. So when I say shallow water, I'm going to start real shallow, maybe like two, three feet. I'm going to hit that for a little bit. If they're not there, then I'm just going to make a slight move because all the fish are going to do is make a slight move to be comfortable. And then I break the water down. If you've heard any of the seminars I've done, I break it down in three to four foot segments. So if they're not in two to, let's say two to four or five feet, then I'm going to go you know, five to seven, eight. And I'm going to know right away because if they're there, they're going to be biting because that's what they're doing in the dog days of summer in the early morning. They're, they're eating. And wherever they're at, that's where I'm going to stay. Local Life Outdoor says, I like cut bait for channels and blues and live brim for flatheads. What do you recommend? Well, I um, hate to give you a, a cheap answer, but I think you nailed it right on the head. I think so, That's too. what I recommend. I mean, I don't need to go any more into that. That's that's You answered the question with the best answer. Cool. Tim Molina is asking again, where are your home waters again? Yeah, so Tim, I'm in Des Moines, Iowa, and if you're not familiar with Iowa, Des Moines is pretty much right square in the middle of the state. Okay, we got two stands fishing. He says he really thinks the, that moving the fate 
are moving. What? Think the moving bait will number one be in front of more active fish, and number two trigger the reaction bite on some of the fish that maybe weren't looking to eat. So he's agreeing with you pretty much. So yeah, and I I do think that um, let's talk about it a little bit if you don't mind. You know, absolutely kind of what, we're, what we're doing. So um, not always do does extra noise on the bottom equal more fish but i'm a big fan of like the verse route or any type of like the ultra chub anything that that's got some noise to it um because it can trigger those fish that are on the on the on the fence of eating and sometimes just having that i think and this is my opinion i think sometimes having that extra noise down there sometimes especially during the spawn and stuff they'll bite it just because of irritating um, but if I can put, if I have five rods out, which is typically what I fish, I'll generally have two or three with some type of rattle or some type of prop or something on them to put mm -hmm. that extra vibration out. And if it gets me two extra fish for the day, it's two more than I would have caught if I didn't have them. Yeah, they don't shy away from, from rattles and stuff at all. I think I've, I've missed them, and I think I they come back more often if they miss the bait and they got a rattle than if they missed it and it didn't. So, But that's just my experience so do you believe that to be true um i generally I, I typically think that when a when a fish misses the bait i think they're done i think yeah. if you get something that comes back to it it's a fish that's nearby that's hungry as well. you think it's a different fish then yeah i don't think that I, I i'm just from hours and hours and hours from the years of doing this uh -huh. i personally think that if you get a decent you know, not a nibble, a nibble that fish can come back and chase it, you know, and a lot of small fish do that. But I'm talking about a loaded rod that that fish just missed the hook. I think they're done. And I think if you get one within a few seconds after that, it's another fish. It's another fish? Oh, it's, it's never thought about it that way, but that's good to know. Justin's fishing fetish says, uh, so how far, well, <clears throat> how far out the back of the boat uh, do you do you drag your baits? Yeah, Justin, that's a good question. So, yeah, we um, had a, we had a long talk about this after the last show that we did. <laughs> right, man. There's a lot to go into to that, and I'm trying to keep it um, somewhat short so we can get to all the other questions. But it really goes off the geometry and how angles work. Um, what I would suggest doing, if you want a more in-depth answer, is going back and watching the previous episode. Where we talk about that for probably a good 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes on that. But to answer your question in a little bit of a shorter answer, um, I, ge I generally let as much line out as I can. And I mean, that's that's quite a bit. So if I'm fishing five rods, and hopefully this will, you know, everything's backwards. So the back of my boat looks like, sorry, like this. This, this one's long, short, long and then i generally don't have one out here i have two off the side and they're on plate or bullets. so that's kind of how i fish those but you'll see that the one in the middle that's a little bit shorter when we get into deeper water that one typically doesn't hook up as much because of the angle and how that bait's presented there but you have you know you got to fish your rods in a, in a way that doesn't tangle everything up and i don't like running by boards so that's the route i go and we I generally throw a big bait on that one or a bigger piece of bait on that. And that way, if they want it, they're going to eat that big bait and they're going to get the hook. If I throw a smaller piece on there and yeah, there's more opportunity um, for them to kind of miss it or whatever the case is, then I'll notice that I get more misses on that. But if I throw a big chunk on there, that rod gets loaded up and it's been over and stays over. So I, did, I get, did I hit that well enough for you? I, I no think point. so. Just, to, just a couple of guys actually were thinking that was a good question. I think you answered it very well. Uh, Twisted Fishing TV asked, uh, I watch channel cats pack hunting. Have you have you observed this from where you're from? So um, I, I've never observed that personally. But well, I can tell you that the group of active fish, when you find them, they're going to be the group of active fish. You can put, and this is why trolling works so well. If you had 
um, let's just say test water, right? You know, you have a test water and you throw your line in and that test water has 100 catfish. And 100 of those catfish are not active, you're not gonna catch them. You go down the, the lake, the river, whatever it is, and you throw it into the, the school of five, and all five of those are active fish, you're gonna catch all five. Or at least you're gonna get five, you know, for swing and take a swing at the ball. So, so it's a matter of the, the active fish, they're pretty much going to be the active fish. I don't know how else to explain that. They're going to be the group of active fish and they're going to be generally, those fish are going to be kind of the pack, if you want to call them that. And they're going to stick around for a while. They're not going to like go off to five miles down the lake and, you know, they're going to be in that group or that family group or that pack or whatever you want to call it until they, they're not. But that group's going to be together. And it's going to be someone on the same biological cycle too. So I don't know that it's necessarily that they hunt like tuna, um, where they maybe circle the baits and, you know, they trap them. Uh, I don't think catfish are smart enough to do that. Or, uh, or the waters offer the ability for them to do that like they do in the ocean. But I think that when you find a pack of active fish, that's exactly what you found is the group of active fish. Do, do you feel that um, if you can get... A one or maybe two of them in that pack of fish to bite that they'll feed off each other, whether yeah, it's just energy so. or not. You can stir them up and they get worked into a frenzy. You do agree with that? Yep. Because okay. the fish, fish do a lot of um, their activity off of their triggers, mm -hmm. like we were talking about before. You know, and if 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 they like perch, okay. When you drop down, when I ice fish for perch, a lot of times I just take a weight drop it down and I'll stir up the bottom mm -hmm. and it just brings those fish over because something happened and then they, you know they'll start feeding and I think it's the same way with channel cats too but now I'm moving pretty quick and they I don't give them a lot of time to figure it out you know they're there and we're gonna get them and they've got just a matter of you know a minute or two before I'm out in the next area so, but I do think you know that, that is what happened Justin's asking braid or mono and why? Okay. Um, I get that question a ton. So yeah, people love to ask that question. Right. And there there's the best way to answer that is the conditions that you're fishing in. And it's gonna be the most general best answer. So braid, you'll have to keep in mind, is less um, less friendly to abrasions. So if you're fishing in heavy uh, wooded area or heavy rocks or sharper rocks, your braid is going to take the abuse more than your mono. Um, if you don't know how to fight a fish well, and a lot of people I find out they don't know the proper way to fight a fish, um, mono is the better option because there's a little bit of stretch and give in that. Whereas with braid, the terminal point of all your pressure is going to be where the hook is into the the flesh of the fish. And if you don't let that fish play the rod in correctly, then the not having that little bit of flex in play is going to rip the hook out of every one of the fish's mouths. That's why a lot of people lose fish with braid. Um, I take a lot of people, like I said earlier, I take a lot of new people out that want to learn different things. And one of the biggest things that people fight is the ability to keep their line tight. So I fish with braid because as soon as I see them start to drop a rod or lower it or get the angle wrong, you know, I can correct them right away. And there's instantly, there's no more slack left in the line with braid. It's tight again. And that's truly the only reason why I, I personally fish braid during, you know, my year of fishing, which is, I don't get a fish for myself. Um, if I did, I would use mono all the time. For one, it's easier if things get tangled up, and when you're when you're trolling with for catfish, things are going to get tangled up. There's no sure way do. to fight that. <laughs> At some point, you're going to have the knotzilla that you don't want to deal with. I call it knitting sweaters. That happens to me <laughs> <Maybe>. quite a bit. <laughs> I have to just I see that coming in. I'm like, I just take a deep breath, close my eyes for a second. Don't don't show that it's it's uh, it's going to be a headache, man. 
but you know when you're not when you're knotted up tangled up whatever mono's a thousand times easier to get undone than braid um, mono offers that little bit of stretch to it it's got a little higher visibility and it doesn't uh, bleach out in the sun and if you are into nighttime fishing um, your blue lights are going to show your line a little bit better so i mean that's a long answer but i would just tell you i guess going back to it and you're trying to make it a little shorter for you it depends on the the conditions you're fishing and hopefully the start of that long answer gives you a little bit better and also what you're what, work best for you. what you're confident with as well i'm going to add that to that too so yeah. i've seen lots of people catch lots of fish on all different signs, kinds of line but everything you said definitely makes sense so uh chris uselton's asking if the usselton is asking the question your pb channel cat i don't know <laughs> honestly i don't know i don't weigh hardly weigh fish uh my best one this year was 15 pounds like right on the button it's got my personal best guy we heard pretty close to that but keep in mind i might catch like 10 fish a year um the whole my whole fishing season is taking people out guiding them so i don't generally get much of a chance to reel anything in. betty jean cross with the question says uh in reality guiding is a job so let's put the job aside for a minute and tell us about your fun fishing and where your dream fishing trip would be and why. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're hundred percent right. My, my work day, if you will, you know, in the summertime, it starts at six and it ends at, at 11 or 1130. If I have the opportunity, um, my fun and guiding is fun it, it is a job but it's fun and but to step outside of that window maybe is the best way to put it and not not say one's fun one's not fun but outside of the guiding part i enjoy being able to call my friends up and say hey man it's been a great morning we're on fish can you meet me at the dock at 11 30 when i drop off my clients so we can go out and you know, put the game plan together for tomorrow and catch some fish, you know, doing it. At some point you have to kind of, when you're, I'm busy, like every day that I'm not at the fire station, I'm guiding. And to avoid some of the burnout, um, you have to allow for some of that other time in there. And you know, I'll, I'll call friends up and I'll say, let's go, we're on fish, put a game plan together for tomorrow. To me, that's, that's, fun fishing and i don't want to say you know guiding is not fun but i think you get right and i don't have a i don't have a dream place i'd like to go fishing um i don't like to travel i hate traveling at all if it's more than an hour i don't go period so i hate to give you a cheap worthless Your answer for that, there's nothing but, wrong with that yeah i get too stressed out traveling so i just don't go justin with what he calls the most important question of the night what snacks do you take on your boat? I don't eat. <laughs> I don't eat on the boat. So um, a lot of people probably don't read their insurance clause. Um, mine says it has commercial guiding insurance, but I'm not to bring food on the boat. So I don't um, because if I, let's say I bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you're allergic to peanuts, you have some kind of anaphylactic reaction. That's so understandable. I can go five hours without eating, um, but I will tell you if I'm fishing with a friend of mine, Twizzlers are pretty darn hard to beat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a sugar guy, but Twizzlers are hard to beat. I know Lyle Stokes at Catfish Weekly. He loves his Twizzlers too. Those and and Vienna sausages. <laughs> I think those are his boat snacks of choice. I have a I'm sorry. Yesterday we had elk sausage and Twizzlers. So there you go. That's not bad at all. It's good stuff. I haven't had elk sausage in a while. Evan, I think we did answer that question already, but he's asking thermal clients and channels. What are your thoughts? Fish above them. Fish all your fish above the thermal. Clients. Yep. Let's see. Uh, all right. Muskrat's asking, uh, do you think sonar will affect catfish lateral lines in shallow waters? No. I don't. I mean, and that's the honest. That's the quick, dirty answer. Um, I don't think that even though those are going out, you know, there's a tick to it. If you run your sonar on dry ground, you'll hear it. Um, 
at times, I, I don't think that that has any impact on it at all. Uh, I think that fish are used to movement, let's just say movement, tickling their lateral body. But I think there's a difference between a more um, aggressive uh, hitch, if you want to call it, or aggressive tone out there, like, like some of the rattles make, that either gets their attention or, or doesn't. But I don't think things as soft as stone I have any impact on them at all. Yeah, we got Betty made a comment that she believes uh, facial hair doesn't matter when it comes to catching fish, and she can get on some fish. She's pretty good at it. Uh, Corey over at the Flatty Daddies is saying it's a great show. Uh, we are at an hour and five. Let's see if we got some more questions here. Yeah, that hour went by way too fast. It does go by quick when we're having a good time. I like talking to you, Dave, definitely. Uh, yeah, he is a he is a mono guy. He does use braid for his customers, Tim. So that's a good question. <laughs> we got some comments out there. Uh, Uncle Lou says lighter rod action will help you keep your bait from doing all the that snapping in those waves. It, that makes sense. Well, it we, can if you have the if you don't have a small or a, like a softer rod you don't have mm -hmm. enough line out it's still gonna it's gonna act almost like a like a slingshot, slingshot almost right yeah so it's just a matter of having a little heavier weight and having that line further from the boat skip wants to know where do we find the seminars that you do well i have been doing some with brad Dirk over the years um and i've also done some at the local bait shops so anytime well i should say the last handful of um, catfish universities that Dirk put on i've been part of uh was asked to do one at the catfish conference but i'm not gonna be there this year um uh, i'm trying to think if i had anything going on you would post it on your right now, uh, but I don't on your Facebook page if you you had something set up, correct? So keep an uh, eye. On your... I'm not sure, and it's okay. I don't well, have to look at the calendar. But all right. Cool. Well, no, I mean uh, in the future, if they want to see you somewhere in the future, you would post something like that. Oh, on your yeah, social absolutely. Media? Yeah, you're gonna okay. you're gonna find that on on Instagram and Facebook. Freddie's asking how many rods. You had said you like to do five, so we went over yep. that. Uh, how much line do you throw out before you attach a, a planer board? Yeah, so that's a fabulous question. Because, I agree. Uh, I th I personally think there's a better way to do it than a lot of people do, where they just drop it off the side of the boat, they hit bottom, maybe swing the rod a couple times to get a few uh, feet of extra slack out and put the board on. What I do is I just give it a um, a slow pitch. I guess it's kind of. And this may be kind of hard to see, but if I'm just casting just a, a nice, easy, slow, you know, slow pitch to get it maybe like 15 feet or so from the boat. And then I let it hit the bottom. I'll give it a few sweeps out. And it does a couple different things. It's going to cover the different depth changes that I'm going to go to. And it's also, and then I'll attach that board on it. And it's also going to allow me time to unclip that board before the fish is underneath the boat. So that you know, that's key. Anytime that there's a a opportunity for slack, uh, those fish are going to take it. They're going to feel that too. They're fighting a fish. You don't realize they're they're actually pretty smart up to what's going on down there. If they feel a slight delay or or slack in the line, you're, it's amazing how quickly it, they get off it. It feels it's like what, an escape route to them, right? Yeah, it's just. Uh, I mean, it's it's like magic. They just know it's there and they're gone. So by putting that planer board out further, but not you know excessively far, and I don't throw them out as far as I can and put a board on them. Um, I just pitch them off to the side of the boat, like I said, 15, 20 feet. Let it go down, sweep the the rod a few times to get some slack out there, and I put my board on. But when I'm when I am getting that board off. It's just a second to take it off, but I don't have to deal with that and a bent rod in my face and the line going, you know, tight straight down. So that's that's a good question that that can keep you from losing a lot of fish. 
Yeah, we had that conversation too offline last time because I was having that problem. So, uh, Danny Stone Outdoor says, "How often do you change out your the line on your reels?" Once a year. And that's uh, braid, correct? Yeah. See, right there, Lyle said, did someone say Twizzlers? I told you. <laughs> Twizzlers are the bomb. Brent, Brent, uh, Brent says, I'm pulling up with snacks to sell your customers next year. <laughs> <laughs> Brett's pretty cool. You know, he, he's, he posted a picture of me fishing in the or driving the boat or whatever with some, some clients, and he says, you always know you're in the right spot when these guys show up. <laughs> Mike a French shop. A French shop a, after that. Michael Morello Fishing uh, says, what is your best advice regarding areas of the lake to focus bank fishing at Sailorville and Big Creek Lake? Yeah, so those are my home bodies of water. Um, I'm going to reread that question again here. So it's a little smaller. Print. Give me just a quick second here for bank fishing. Well, I'm... I think the best way to answer that is to understand, like get a map of the lake and understand where your contours are going to be. So I can tell you, you know, you're going to go a uh, hundred yards from the mile long bridge north or south, but that doesn't really necessarily mean anything um, because 99% of the people here aren't going to get anything out of an answer. So the best thing that I can tell you is if you get a, a map of the lake and there's a bunch of them for the lake, the, you know, you know, list. Sailorville and, and Big Creek, um, you're going to look for those tight contours is generally what I want to go try to hit first. And those are going to be um, good areas of cover. And it's going to offer different um, structure to those bodies of water. Where Sailorville, there's a very minimal structure. Um, so finding the, those contours or where everything kind of comes together and to offer like a funnel. Um, those are going to be spots that, that I would look for for the bank on bank fishing. And you, there's there's those things out on Big Creek as well. Um, you just have to, to, to get a map of it and look. But I generally don't typically just throw right on the platform or something in the bank. I want to try to be around some type of structure. I hope that gives you the answer you need because I'm sure I'll probably see you around on, on one of those two bodies a lot. Cool. Hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Um... Buck Williams says, it's been great, Mark. About time, Channel Cat's got some love. I totally agree. Channel Cat's a hard fighting fish. Betty Jean says, uh, I got to work tomorrow, so it's past my bedtime. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, amazing guests, amazing shows always, Mark. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, dragging speed, uh, what general... Um, we generally drag at 0. 0.6 to one mile an hour is what Freddie does. How about you? Yeah, it's going to go specifically on what the water temperature is. So early spring, um, you know, ice out, it's not generally a great time to patrol. Um, that's going to be a, a, where your bank fishing or your anchor fishing is really going to be king and, and rule over dragging baits along. But as the water warms up, the speed warms up. So uh, typically, I, what at the end of the year, I was going at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, maybe 0 0.4. I'm just, bar I'm barely moving. Those fish are slowing down. They're still aggressive, but they're slowing down. And then come midsummer, you know, I mean, and we're catching fish at a mile an hour or, you know, 1.1, 1 .1 and, and they hammer it at 1.1, 1 .1, about shake the whole boat. Can, can you drag too slow in the summer? Or are you just trying to cover bodies of water? You know, or yeah, the distance. You, I guess, you can't technically drag too slow in the sun. But what you can do is you can catch more fish by covering more water. More ground. Okay. So you know that's kind of what made me pause on that and think because it's like yeah you you can the speed isn't really the key it's the numbers game you know it's the law of probability. Mm -hmm. The more water I cover, the more fish in theory I'm going to catch. Um, so I find the pot of active fish and I stay on. And there's some times where that pot of active fish pods because they're fish moving in and out. 
like we talked about on the last episode, it's like a couple of years ago, it was five weeks, five weeks of 800 yards of water up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And we didn't, you know, we didn't change. That's it. a lot of turning. Yeah. I got yeah. sick of seeing the same scenery <laughs> all the time, explaining the same thing every day. You know, we're going to go fish this up to that point, And then we're going to turn around and go back. And we're going to do that for five hours every day for five weeks. Don't leave fish to find fish though. Right. Yeah, hundred percent. And that'll bite you, man, every time. It sure does. I did that this weekend and it bit me bad. Uh Whisker Dreams. Uh this is a river question. Anchored up. Uh is it logical to use a planer board on moving water? Yeah, I don't think I'd probably use one in the river system. Yeah, I not anchored up, I would not use it. No, them, I uh, mean yeah, not in that I shouldn't say the river system. I wouldn't use it in, in the question that was posed. All right. Now you could you could use a stern planer and get away with that. I think a stern planer would be a better option than a planer board. Okay. I think we got all the questions, David. You did fantastic. I had a real fun time tonight talking to you. Yeah. I learned quite a bit. I know everybody in chat probably did. Had a lot of people hear you, and I want to thank you again. Um, I do want to say um, best wishes to James. James, uh, uh, if you're out there listening or if you watch this after the fact, uh, we're going to miss you on Catfish Weekly most definitely, uh, and we're always sorry to see you go. So, um, Other than that, thank you very much for your time, Dave. It's It's been a lot of fun. I want everybody to know that Dave's link is in the description. Check it out. Uh, Ch Chasing Cats, correct, is the name of your guide service? Yep, Chasing Cats. Chasing Cats, if you're in the Iowa area, look him up. I guarantee you he'll – well, I'm not I, – I, gar I guarantee you a good time. I guarantee you he's going to try to get you on the fish. <laughs> I'm going to knock on wood in five years. I've never had a skunk. I've had some slow days, but I've never had a skunk. That's that's incredible to be able to say so. All right, everybody. You guys have uh, SK's crappie catching adventures. He's another guide in Texas. He's a crappie guide. He's a heck of a guy. So I'm, he, I'm sure he can uh, uh, relate to a lot of stuff you're going through. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great night, David. Once again, I can't say it enough. Thank you for your time. Uh, everybody have a great week. Get out there and fish.